These days, Lockheed C-5 Super Galaxies are capable of transporting two 70-ton, that's 63,500 kilogram, M1 Abrams tanks nearly anywhere in the world with aerial refueling. That said, getting armored vehicles into combat quickly has been a major problem for militaries since tanks began appearing on battlefields during the First World War. Needless to say, the aircraft of the day just were not up to the task of moving heavy machines. Tipping the scales of more than 30 tons, that's 27,000 kilos, Britain's Mark 1s and Germany's A7Vs were generally transported in pieces on rail cars and assembled as close to the front as possible. Back then, this huge lack of mobility wasn't a huge deal because the Great War was a relatively static conflict. But that wasn't the case during World War II. Neither England nor America had aircraft capable of transporting heavy armored vehicles like Cromwell's and Sherman's. As a result, they were generally moved by ship, unloaded at ports, transported by rail as far as the line would take them, and then driven to their final destinations. The last legs of these time-consuming journeys often involved slow treks through rough terrain and hostile territory where mines, enemy tanks, and well-camouflaged anti-tank guns lurked around nearly every corner. Though relatively efficient, this logistic system couldn't deliver the armored firepower that airborne forces needed to take and hold strategic bridges, railheads, and crossroads, which meant that they were particularly vulnerable when deployed ahead of a larger fighting force. What they needed was a small tank that packed a moderately big punch, had decent armor protection, and good cross-country mobility, and could be delivered to out-of-the-way hotspots quickly. Enter the M22 Locust. By early 1941, England had emerged victorious from the Battle of Britain, but resources were scarce, the Nazi war machine was ravaging Europe, and the island nation's survival was certainly far from certain. With airborne forces playing increasingly critical roles on the continent, the British war officers had help from America in designing a light tank that could accompany them into battle, often far behind enemy lines. Established by the order of Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the summer of 1940, Britain's inexperienced airborne force wasn't particularly suited to the armored warfare of the day. Since its inception, most units had been equipped with Vickers Armstrong Mark VII Tetrarch-like tanks, but since they hadn't been designed to be transported by aircraft, the War Office concluded that the new purpose-built machines would give the airborne forces more of a fighting edge. The project was of critical importance, but Britain didn't possess appropriate aircrafts, nor did it have the time, resources, or manufacturing capacity to develop and build them on their own, and in light of these limitations, gliders seemed like a logical and cost-effective alternative. Ironically, however, due to their thin armor and anemic guns, light tanks had fared poorly in early engagements, and regular armor units had already started phasing them out. Nonetheless, airborne units were never meant to slug it out with heavy panzer divisions, and after brief negotiations between rep representatives from America and Britain, the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps was tasked with developing an entirely new light tank that could be used by the airborne forces of both countries. The RFPs were sent to a number of domestic manufacturers, and ultimately Marmon Harrington's design beat out those submitted by more established defense contractors like Chrysler and General Motors. Official specifications were issued in the spring of 1941 for an ultralight tank that could be transported by glider as far as 350 miles, that's 560 kilometers. Since General Aircraft's hammer car was nearing the end of its development at about the same time, they would ultimately carry the new Locust tanks into battle. Nearly 70 feet long, 110 feet wingtip to wingtip, and capable of hauling 17,000 pound payloads internally, hammer cars were affordable and easy to produce alternatives to powered transport aircraft. Locusts featured 37mm cannons as their main armament and defensive fire came from two 30 caliber machine guns, one coaxially mounted alongside the main gun and the other protruding from the right side of the hull. Engine type and power output were left largely up to the manufacturer, but spec stated a maximum speed of 40 miles per hour and operational range of 200 miles. The turret and front part of the hull would be protected by between 40 and 50 millimeters of steel plate armor, but the back and sides were far thinner. Locusts were to be crewed by three, but only because their small size just didn't leave enough room for a fourth crewman. Unfortunately, this didn't sit particularly well with armored airborne units because in combat, Tetrarchs had proven that the commander, gunner, and driver couldn't perform all of the tasks.
tasks required of them quickly and efficiently. In addition to their own duties, commanders also had to be loading shells into the cannon. Though not particularly strenuous or time-consuming under normal conditions, during the deafening chaos of combat, this often prevented them from seeing what was going on around them and communicating with ground forces and other armored vehicles. Despite this serious Achilles heel, however, Marmon Harrington delivered the first prototype in late 1941. Coming in at almost exactly 7.2 tons, the new machine was designated Light Tank T9 Airborne. Both the main gun and coaxial machine gun were mounted in a powered turret, the larger of which was stabilized to permit firing while on the move, though under most conditions this was impractical. But though Marmon Harrington stuck to most of the original specifications, they had little choice but to skimp on armor protection to keep the weight down. In fact, up front where it mattered most, the steel plate was half as thick as it was supposed to be. Powered by Lycoming air-cooled six-cylinder engines producing about 160 horsepower, T9s could just manage to achieve the maximum road speed that they'd been specified for by the war office. It was hoped that improved mobility would compensate for this deficiency and ultimately increase crew survivability, but another glaring deviation was that T9s weren't primarily designed to be transported by glider, but by Douglas C-54 Skymasters. Not only were Skymasters expensive and in short supply, but they needed finished airstrips for takeoff and landing, and even worse, well, Britain didn't have any. Thankfully, however, Marmon Harrington's T9s were just the right size to squeeze inside hammer car gliders, suggesting that the original specifications hadn't been ignored altogether. After a few minor tweaks in the first unit, two new prototypes were ordered by the Ordnance Corps in January 1942, both of which were delivered the following November. The new tanks featured a number of upgrades, but the turret's power traverse motor and the gun stabilizer had to be removed to compensate for the weight gains that had resulted from the other improvements. Now turrets would need to be manually traversed by an already overworked three-man crew. Yet despite these and other issues that would surface during testing, the Ordnance Corps pre-ordered 500 T9s. After preliminary evaluation in America, the T-9s were shipped to Britain in the summer of 1943, and testing was carried out until the end of the year. By tank standards, the new machines were light, fast, and transportable, but a number of serious flaws emerged as well. In addition to unpowered turrets, T-9's thin armor wasn't capable of stopping even heavy machine gun rounds. Worse yet, when fired from close range, the 37mm cannon projectiles lacked the energy necessary to penetrate the armor of most German tanks. Likewise, a number of mechanical issues were discovered, including weak transmissions and suspension components, both of which made locusts unreliable. Though the War Office was adamant about transporting M22s into combat via glider, trials were carried out with C-54 transports as well. However, the loading and unloading processes were tedious, time-consuming, and involved the use of complex equipment that would only be available at well-supplied airbases. An even heavier transport aircraft, the Fairchild C-82 Packet, was delivered to carry M-22s specifically, but it didn't enter service until after the war had ended. Though not exactly game-changing machines by nearly any measure, the War Office concluded that with the right training and tactics, M-22s could perform well with airborne units. At least that was the official story, but the truth was that M-22s were ordered into production because at the time there was simply no better option. Due to last-minute design changes, full-scale production didn't begin until late 1943, after which nearly 100 units were produced each month until January of the following year. In a critical report released in 1943, US Army officials categorically stated that when it came to reliability, firepower protection, and ease of transport, M22s were wholly inadequate. In short, Marmon Harrington's little tanks were duds, but as such, the Army wouldn't assign them to its airborne units. Instead, they were classified as limited standard, a less than flattering term reserved for equipment that failed to meet the minimum criteria required for combat use. On the bright side, this unfortunate turn of events didn't mean that the United States was stuck with a bunch of useless light tanks that it didn't want. On the contrary, thanks to the wonders of the Lend-Lease Act, it gladly unloaded nearly 270 of them on its closest ally, Great Britain. Designated light tank squadrons and attached to Britain's 1st Airborne Division, the units that were eventually equipped with M22s were tasked with conducting pre-operation reconnaissance and, when necessary, capturing and holding strategic objectives until the rest of the division arrived to reinforce them. Along with a few Tetrarchs, more than a dozen M22s were scheduled to participate in Britain's airborne landings at Normandy, codenamed Operation Tonga. By then, however, Britain's limited Hamilcar gliders had been retrofitted to carry Tetrarchs only because, though they were older, Mark 7s had bigger guns, better armor, 
similar and were far less prone to breakdowns. But in the spring of 1945, locusts did see limited action in Operation Varsity, where airborne units supported the 21st Army Group by dropping behind enemy lines and securing several vital bridges over the River Rhine before the Germans could blow them up. One by one, on the morning of March the 24th, eight Handley Page Halifax bombers lumbered down long runways and struggled skyward over RAF Tarrant Rushton. Towed behind them, tethered by long steel cables, were eight Hamilcar gliders, each of which contained an M22 Locust in its cavernous cargo area. As the largest airborne operation ever carried out on a single day at one location, the Air Armada included hundreds of powered aircraft and gliders and more than 15,000 paratroopers destined for vessel in Germany. With light winds and clear skies, the weather couldn't have been any better, and all eight Hamel cars arrived on site as scheduled. Just as they were about to detach from their tow cables, however, a catastrophic airframe failure caused one glider to disintegrate, after which the locust it had been carrying plummeted to the ground more than a thousand feet below. Under increasing small arms and heavy anti-aircraft fire, three more gliders sustained damage and crashed just as they were about to land. All told, just four locusts made it onto the ground fit for action, and of those that did, one had a damaged gun, while another had an inoperable radio. One tank crew attempted to assist a group of American paratroopers who'd been pinned down by machine gun fire, only to be knocked out by a self-propelled 88mm flak gun. Ultimately, only two locusts reached their rendezvous point, where they immediately took the high ground in support of an exposed infantry company. But though the sight of armor initially seemed like a blessing to the beleaguered grunts, they soon realized that they may have been better off on their own. In fact, the locusts drew attention from nearby German artillery that may have otherwise concentrated on higher priority targets. Since the locusts offered little protection to the soldiers outside or crewmen inside, and because their guns could have matched the German artillery's range, the British airborne forces were forced to withdraw after taking heavy losses. Not surprisingly, Operation Varsity was the last time M22s ever saw action in the British Army. The truth was that they were too lightly armored, and they didn't pack a big enough punch, and the time and expense of transporting them into battles in which they had little chance of surviving proved to just be a uh, bit of a waste of really precious resources. Immediately after the war, all were labeled obsolete and taken out of service. With the arrival of the jet age in the 1950s, new post-war transport aircraft were substantially more powerful than their 40s counterparts. However, by then the very concept of light tanks was seen as hopelessly outdated. All told, more than 800 M22s were produced, but after the war, many were destined to live out their golden years in forgotten warehouses and dismal tank parks in both America and England. Others were simply sold for scrap. However, two gunless locusts ended up in the hands of a frugal Illinois farmer named Camille Dupree, who bought them from the Rock Island Armory for $100 each in 1946. Figuring he could use one as a tractor and keep the other in reserve for spare parts, the farmer and his repurposed war machines were even featured in a Life magazine article later that year. In summary, Mr. Dupree claimed that his M22s were too light, too difficult to use, too unreliable, and just not up to the tasks which had bought them, which, ironically, were the same conclusions made by both the British and the American armies. In Britain, some surviving locusts were relegated to training duties, while others were shipped off to foreign armies like those of Belgium and Egypt, the latter of which were used as scout and reconnaissance vehicles in the Arab-Israeli War of 1948.